Hi everyone, welcome to Hacking IEEE 802.15.4 Low Rate Wireless Networks. My name is Dan Perrett, I'm one of the volunteers with the RF Hacker Sanctuary, and I help run, I help design and run challenges for the radio frequency capture the flag that we run at several conferences throughout the, throughout the country, and part of that is uh, what prompted this talk. So what we're going to be talking about today is uh, what is IEEE 802.15.4? Uh, it's not something that a lot of people have heard of, unless you're very familiar with some of these, these low rate protocols. Uh, we're going to talk about sending and receiving IEEE 802.15.4 data and some hardware and software tools uh, to do that. I think that's kind of the, the most basic you can get with, uh, with hacking uh, these types of networks. Uh, and then we're going to talk about some RF Capture the Flag 802.15.4 challenges. Uh, the, there's a basic IEEE 802.15.4 challenge. There's also a six low pan challenge that I've been running for a little while, and then a new challenge that I introduced uh, very recently. Uh, so that if you're looking for zero days or you know, new novel research, that's, that's not what's going to be in this talk. Uh, I'm going to be talking about how to interact at a basic level with some of these types of networks. Uh, it's something that I've seen people seem to struggle with a little bit, and I want to you know, share what I've learned about interacting with some of the, these signals. Uh, mandatory disclaimer, the viewpoints, opinions, and recommendations in this presentation are my own, and they're not representative of that. the views, opinions, or recommendations of my employer. So what is IEEE 802.15.4? Uh, IEEE 802.15.4 is a standard from the IEEE for low-rate wireless networks. It was first introduced in uh, 2003. Uh, it defines the physical and the MAC layers, uh, meaning like how how the physical signal is is sent over the air, and then also the media access control layer. So different um, addressing different devices on that network. So we're talking about point to point from one device to another. Uh, that's the kind of thing that's um, that this standard specifies. The latest version is I 802.15.4 2020. Uh, so that was released two years ago. You can get a PDF of that, that standard for free under the IEEE GET program. Uh, it's about an 800-page standard. Uh, if you really want to read through the entire thing, have a good time. Uh, we're going to be focusing on just the most, the most common things that are in there. So 802.15.4 can range anywhere from 169 megahertz up to 10.2 gigahertz, depending on which physical uh, layer implementation you're using. Uh, they actually do define a couple of different options for the physical layer. Uh, I don't know that those are. I don't know that some of those are all that common, but they, they are possibilities. Uh, in the in the U.S., the 2.4 gigahertz and the 915 megahertz bands are the most common. Uh, the 915 megahertz band uh, is split up into two megahertz channels from one to ten, and then the 2.4 gigahertz band is split up into five megahertz channels, uh, numbers 11 through 26. Uh, I would say the 2.4 gigahertz band is probably the most common, uh, or at least that those are what we're going to be talking about when we get to the challenges later. So I mentioned that you know, IEEE 8254 defines the physical and the MAC layers for, uh, for sending these signals. And so let's talk just a little bit about you know, the OSI model, and we're going to we're introducing, I'm going to talk about that just a little bit because the OSI model, I think, is the networking abstraction model that most people are familiar with. Uh, it's not perfect, and you know, so we're not, not going to dive super deep into you know, things like you know, certain, certain protocols kind of split some of these layers, like the data link layer in particular, and how IEEE defines things slightly differently than OSI. Um, but the main thing I want to want people to take away from this is that there are different layers, and we're talking about those bottom two layers, the physical and the data link layer, or the physical and the MAC layer. So if you're talking about other protocols like Ethernet, those that's at the same level, the physical and the data link layer. Same thing with Wi-Fi, physical and data link again. Uh, on top of that, you can use other protocols like IPv4, IPv6, TCP UDP, TLS, PPTP, SOX, and all the way up to the application level, level HTTP. So IEEE 802.15.4 lives down at those first and second layers. Uh, very, very short rant and a nitpick, IEEE 802.15.4 is not the same as Zigbee. So 
a lot of people have heard of Zigbee. It's got a really catchy name. It's, it's great in its own right, but it is not the same thing. So IEEE 802.15.4 is the Mac layer and the physical layer that Zigbee uses. However, they are not interchangeable terms. So taking a look back at the OSI model, IEEE 802.15.4 is at the physical and Mac layer. Zigbee, 6 low pan, uh, thread, all that. Uh, there are some other things, too, that you can put over 802.15.4. Those are all in those higher, le higher level uh, layers. So next up, receiving and sending 802.15.4. So again, I think the, this is sort of the most basic thing that you can do with some of these signals, aside from maybe just detecting that there might be a signal at all. So if you look in the background uh, underneath the, the presentation, under, underneath the slides, you see a scrolling waterfall display that's actually centered up on a fairly active uh, 802.15.4 channel. Uh, and you can see some things that are about 5 megahertz wide, and those are very likely 802.15.4 packets. Uh, this is also overlapping in the range of Wi-Fi, so some of the more broad spectrum things are likely not 802.15.4 packets. Uh, but there, there's a decent number of 802.15.4 packets scrolling through the, uh, that waterfall behind me. So some of the common tools for sending and receiving 802.15.4 packets were, that we're going to run through. Killer B, uh, Open Labs 802.15.4 radios for Raspberry Pis, uh, Nordic, Nordic Dongle, Sewa Open Sniffer, uh, Freak Labs has a Freak USB uh, dongle that, that is helpful and also uh, some SDR tools, uh, or software-defined radio tools for, for interacting with it. So first up is Killer B. Uh, this is kind of the, the OG for manipulating IEEE 802.15.4 uh, uh, traffic, also Zigbee. Yeah, the name Killer B comes from, uh, from Zigbee. Uh, it's obviously some inspiration there. Um, so this is it's an old, old tool set, and it's fantastic for capturing and manipulating uh, traffic. Uh, some of the hardware that you can get for it is, or that, that can be used with Killer B. So the Appymote V4 up at the top there, uh, that's something that uh, Ryan Spears and Sergey brought us, uh, introduced at DEF CON a number of years ago. And that is, that's a fantastic tool for, for interacting with some of these networks. Uh, Downside, for, for a while it was a little bit hard to get. I think you, there's actually a vendor now sell, selling those for somewhere around $150 or something. I haven't entered, I don't have any experience with that particular vendor. Uh, Sergey and Ryan were nice enough to give me one of, the, one of these uh, boards after their talk at DEF CON. Uh, and I very much appreciate that. That's enabled me to mess around with a number of different things, number of different uh, 802.15.4 protocol or devices. Uh, also, the Atmel U RG RZ USB stick, which unfortunately is not made any longer. So this was somewhere around $30 when it was available. Uh, sadly, Atmel decided to stop making it. Uh, this is something that you could flash with the, um, with the Killer B firmware and then use that with the Killer B tools like you know, ZB Dump, ZB Replay, and all that, that sort of thing. Uh, something that I haven't used, but I'm, I've heard that other people are using with some success, the TI-CC2531 uh, dongle, which you can see down in the lower right there. Uh, that, as I understand it, is, uh, is capable of sniffing only with Killer B, uh, but that's another viable option for potentially capturing 802.15.4 traffic with Killer B. Uh, next up, the Open Labs 802.15.4 radio. So this is something that can transmit and receive uh, 802.15.4 and 6 low pan. Uh, it's open source hardware. Uh, you can sniff with TCP dump, at least within you know, the channel that you're uh, currently on. Uh, it's fairly inexpensive at around $13 when it's available. Uh, there unfortunately is sort of intermittent availability with it. That said, it is open source hardware, so if you really want to, you can make your own. Not something I've tried yet. Uh, I might, might try to, to do that at some point, but you know, there's something that, that is an option to you. Uh, potential downside to using this is that you do need to compile the kernel for the Raspberry Pi and or the modules. So I think you might just be missing a module for, for the, the default uh, Raspberry Pi images at this point. Uh, there's a helpful guide at, um, at the, the link that's in that slide right there. And something I've followed to to recompile the kernel and the kernel modules for to make this module work. Uh, you also need WPAN tools, which is another open source project. Um, so there, that guide is not not 100% perfect, but 
uh, it's evolved over time. It makes mention of a few different kernel versions uh, that were problematic at a certain point. Uh, I, th I believe that current versions of the, the Raspberry Pi kernel are compatible with this module and with 6 Lopan and all that fun stuff. Uh, I think the, the latest version I was running was 5.10 point something. Uh, don't quote me on that exact version, but it's something very recent, uh, much more recent than is listed in uh, those directions. You should be able to get things working. Um, yeah. Uh, also from Open Labs, a couple of things I haven't tried yet, but I think are potentially interesting. Uh, there's a Pi 6 low pan slip radio. So basically what this does, it has some firmware on it that will just talk IPv6 over a slip link to the, the Raspberry Pi. Uh, and so the kernel itself is not interacting with the, the radio. Uh, there's potential pros and cons to that. It's a potentially interesting thing. It's also a relatively inexpensive uh, module, just like the other one. Uh, again, not something I've tried, but it looks looks interesting, and I know the guy that made it is using them with uh, with success. Uh, also, this uh, KW41Z mini board that's got an ARM Cortex processor in it, and it's also capable of Bluetooth low energy, can run on a coin cell battery. Again, not something I've uh, I've used myself, but it looks like a viable option for for interacting with some of these uh, six low pan networks in particular. Next up, the Nordic NRF five two eight four zero dongle. Uh, this is a USB dongle uh, that can. It's very versatile. It's got firmware available that can sniff Bluetooth low energy and also uh, firmware for sniffing eight hundred two fifteen four traffic. Uh, there's a Python script which is available to use as an XCAP interface for Wireshark, meaning you can have this external script captured directly into Wireshark, and you can control this module from wire, from the GUI in Wireshark. Uh, it's relatively inexpensive at around $10, and you can get it on uh, both DigiKey, Mouser, and I'm sure some other vendors, uh, vendors online. Uh, next up, the Sewo Open Sniffer. This is not something I have, uh, but I've heard heard good things about it. It's a multi-band 802.15.4 sniffer. Uh, it's very expensive at around $622 was when I checked. It was the price element last I checked, you know, within a week or two ago. Uh, there is a killer B firmware available. Something I noticed about this particular sniffer uh, when looking at it is that the it's got two different transceivers on it uh, using the, the chips listed there, the Atmel, uh, Atmel chips there, one for, one for the sub-gigahertz bands and one for the 2.4 gigahertz band. Uh, interestingly enough, that is the same transceiver chip that's used in a couple of the other things, like the Open Labs uh, 802.15.4 board, uh, also something that we're going to talk about next. There are a couple of different things that use that chip for interacting with 802.15.4. Uh, this just has two of them and does some processing to make everything a little bit easier. So if you're looking for a more professional type sniffer, this might be something that uh, that you should look into. The Freak Labs Freak USB is another option for sniffing 802.15.4. Uh, this again uses the same same chips depending on which version you get. So they have 2.4 gigahertz and 900 megahertz options. Uh, they use the same chips as the Sewo Open Sniffer, and it's basically an Arduino that's interacting with that chip. Uh, so there's a sniffing firmware which is available as a, an Arduino example uh, sketch that you upload to the dongle, and then you can sniff, uh, sniff packets that way. Uh, pros to this, you can program it with an Arduino, so if you're looking to write some Arduino code that interacts with 802.15.4 stuff, this would be a really good, good thing to use. Uh, unfortunately, in some of my testing, I found that it dropped packets, especially when trying to, to monitor uh, six low pan uh, data and trying to monitor, say, repeating pings uh, or ping sixes over six low pan. I found that it, it seemed to drop some packets uh, compared to some of the other sniffing solution or some of the other sniffing options that I mentioned. Uh, and I also noticed that it seems to be currently unavailable. I'm not sure if that's a permanent thing or if that's just the particular website I was going to uh, wasn't around, but that's something to, to consider when looking at these. If you already have one, great, you can do some, some good stuff with it. Um, but if you're looking to buy something new, you might not be able to find one of these. Uh, last up, I wanted to mention uh, GR IEEE 802.15.4. This is um, an out of tree module for a GNU radio that can interact with 802.15.4. I think they have a couple of different physical layer implementations. Uh, available in this in this auditory module, uh, both 
uh, OQPSK and CSS. Uh, they might have others at this point, I'm not 100% sure, but this is something that you could potentially use to use a, a USRP as a trans transceiver or potentially a Blade RF or something like that. Uh, that said, this is a little bit more difficult to set up. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't work just out of the box necessarily. Um, it's not something that I've been able to get working, which doesn't mean that it doesn't work. It just means that I haven't, I haven't spent enough time to get this working myself, but this is something that I'm sure it works based on the amount of work that's gone into it. And I have a lot of respect for the guy that made it. Uh, so I'm, I have no doubt that it does work if you get it, if you get it set up correctly. Uh, but this is something that you could use to send and receive 802.15.4 packets and have a lot of control over every aspect of you know, the physical layer, the Mac layer, every, everything you want. Next up, the RFCTF 802.15.4 challenges. So in the RF capture the flag, uh, for anybody that's uh, participated in that, you've probably seen uh, some of these little devices. These are Arduino Unos with little XB boards on them. So that is an XB S1. Uh, the, so those are, are XBs that communicate over 802.15.4 if you configure them to do so. Uh, it's, so these are simulating an industrial, control, an industrial temperature sensor. Uh, the idea behind this challenge is I wanted something that was just plain 802.15.4, very basic point-to-point -point communication, just sending a little bit of data, which I think is what uh, 802.15.4 is really designed for. It's sending small amounts of data back and forth just between a couple of different points. Now, you can be more complicated than that, but this is, I feel like, about you know, a very small amount of data going back and forth between you know, the simulated sensor on the right there without the, the LCD and then the simulated display, which is on the left with that, um, with that LCD display on it. So the idea here is that for there are a couple parts to the challenge. Uh, one is to receive the 802.15.4 traffic. And so in addition to sending the simulated temperature data uh, from the transmitter to the display, uh, there's also a key that's being transmitted in ASCII uh, across that. So if you if you're sniffing this traffic for a little while, you'll see a bunch of a bunch of simulated data, and then you'll also see an ASCII key go across uh, in clear text at some point. The second part of the challenge is reverse engineering this this basic protocol, decoding it, and then uh, transmitting a value that's outside of the normal range. So I took the the temperature ranges for this based on what's necessary for, for melting glass. Uh, and the idea is that this would be a, a glass oven, something that's you know, heating up for a little while and then it gets up to a certain amount, a certain, certain level, and then it goes back down and kind of cools off, kind of uh, fluctuating in temperature like an oven would. And it fluctuates within a certain, a certain range. And if you watch for long enough, you'll see what that range is. Uh, and the transmit part of the cha this challenge is to transmit something outside of that range, hopefully triggering an alarm, you know, transmitting something that's too hot for, for this particular oven or this simulated oven. A couple possible solutions for this. Uh, when I designed the challenge originally, I intended for Killer B to be used with, uh, to decode and to, to replay the traffic for this challenge. So one possible way you could do this is take Killer B with whatever dongle you're, uh, you happen to have sniff the traffic with ZB dump, and then take that traffic. You can extract the, the receive key, the RX key in ASCII out of Wireshark or whatever else you're using to, to look at that traffic. And then you can take that, that PCAP and create, and either create a new one or modify that PCAP and replay that with ZB replay. Uh, you can also, at the same time that you're doing that, if you're sniffing with a second dongle, uh, you'll be able to receive the the transmit key you know, once you once you successfully complete that part of the challenge. Uh, an alternate solution is sniffing traffic with a tool of your choice. Doesn't necessarily have to be Killer B. Could be anything. Uh, you can do things like identify the channel, the pan ID, the source and destination um, for the the sensor and the uh, trend for the sensor and the display. And then if you have an XB module, an XB Series One module. Uh, you can configure that to send and receive frames just through the configuration tool uh, XCTU that's used for configuring XB modules. So here's an example of what that what that data looks like when when it's going across. So 
you can see here there are a bunch of data packets going from a source of all zeros to a destination of uh, one. So that is the, the simulated sensor transmitting to the display. And you can see there's a very small amount of data, uh, just five bytes uh, at the end there. And that, that's all that's going back and forth, uh, all, all that's going from the transmitter to the display. Go back real quick here. Uh, you also notice there's a destination pan of 3332, um, and that's something else that, that we'll need to, to plug into the, um, to the configuration if we want to interact with this. So in this case, uh, the channel, what, channel that I had set was channel F, or 15. Uh, I have the pan ID plugged in there, uh, destination address of 1. Uh, in this case, I also have my address set to 1, uh, so I can potentially receive, receive data. You can, you can mess around with those and have your destination and uh, your source address be the same. You could have them be different. You could have them configured exactly like the transmitter or the receiver. Uh, there are a couple of different things you can do here uh, in order to, to receive all the data and to be able to send the data to where you want to get it to go. Uh, something important here is the, the MAC mode. Uh, I have that set to 802.15.4 with Axe. There's a couple options in there with the MAC stream header. That's not necessary for what we're doing and that uh, could make it incompatible. So I was trying to make this as plain vanilla 802.15.4 as possible. Uh, could have done no Axe, but decided to go with, with Axe for, for whatever reason. Uh, once you have that all set up, in the console log, if you open that up, you can see a bunch of data scrolling scrolling past. Uh, you'll see there's a bunch of bunch of five byte hex values uh, on the right there, and then a couple of longer ones. And you can see that the longer ones are just an ASCII DEFCON 30 demo RX key. So that's something I just set up just for a demo. The other ones are simulating the, uh, the actual temperature. You can see in there there's a 53, which is an ASCII S. Uh, in that case, in this case, that's just to to simulate. Hey, this is this is the type of sensor I, I'm, I am, or it's something to identify the type of of transmission. The next two bytes are are the actual simulated temperature, and then that's followed by a one byte checksum. And zero D is just a new line or a carriage return. It's, it's an artifact of how the how the code is written to send stuff over the XP. So once you once you figure that stuff out, you can uh, you've got got the receive key. You can also try to craft packets to send them some back to the the, uh, the simulated display. Uh, that's something you can do through XCTU. You can construct packets uh, just like I have up on the screen here, and then you can send the packets uh, either you know once or multiple times, and depending on what you send. So there are a couple different things I saw over the over the amount of time we've been running this challenge. The first one, first one I implemented with no checksum at all and saw people immediately just jump straight to changing, changing the values to all Fs. Like, okay, that, that works, that's, uh, but what if we had add some basic error checking and that's where the checksum came into play. And so at this point, this iteration of the challenge, there are a couple different uh, error states or a couple different things that uh, the challenge will detect. One is, you know, if you just kind of blindly send all Fs to it, including with a checksum, it'll send back a, a nope key. So basically, the display detected a really a really rudimentary attack. It knows that that should never happen. It's Everything was all Fs. Um, somebody just kind of blindly went in there and did that and sent it. So this is a the one slightly negative, one negative flag that we have in there. So if you send this and submit that key, you'll get some negative points. Not a lot, we figured you know, that was it's kind of mean when people were doing that to, to go too negative with it. Uh, next up is the try harder key. So basically what, what this is, is you captured a packet and then you modified the right bits for temperature and modified that to something, something higher, but you didn't update the checksum. So this is a checksum mismatch. So that's like, you were, you were real close, try a little harder. So that, that's the try harder key. Finally, down to the bottom there, we have uh, modifying the modifying the packet to include both the updated temperature data and also the correct checksum for that data, and that gets you the the actual TX key. 
you know, here are some examples. So if you if you modify the data and send a send a temperature outside uh, outside of a valid range just a little bit, you get you know the screen will also turn yellow. And if you send it way over um, correctly, then the screen will start flashing red uh, as though there were an alarm going off. And that's when it'll when it'll transmit the key back to you. Next up is the six low pan challenge. So six low pan is IPv6 over IEEE 82154. And this is something that is defined in IETF RFC uh, 4944, if you care to read up on that. Um, basically, all it's doing is defining a way of sending IPv6 packets over 82.15.4 networks. So uh, you, can, you can have IPv6 addresses on your, your IoT network that is running 802.15.4 stuff. Uh, interesting thing about 6 low pan is that uh, an IPv6 packet is a lot bigger than what a, the max size of an IEEE 8254 packet. Um, so an IPv6 packet needs, uh, the MTU on that is 1,280 octets, and an IEEE 802.15.4 frame is only 127. So there's there's a lot, a lot of overhead that you need to crunch down into a much smaller space to get this to work. Uh, so a lot of what the standard defines is how to compress the headers for IPv6 and also how to fragment uh, those packets across multiple IPv6 packets. Uh, this is something something to consider when when looking at sniffing traffic for six low pan networks. Uh, something that that I thought was a problem. I thought that something I learned while preparing for this talk was that I thought that. Six low pan actually increased the the MTU of 802.15.4. I think that's actually not right. I think it uh, just compresses the headers and does some fragmentation uh, to get the uh, to get the traffic to flow across those networks. Um, and I thought that the the MTU was was bigger because there are some tools. Uh, Killerby in particular, last time I tried to capture six low pan traffic with it, uh, wasn't capturing properly, and I wasn't sure why. I thought this was why it was. I, I might be wrong about that. But all that to say, there are some tools that capture six low pan properly. There are some that do not. Double check what you're what you're looking at if you're trying to monitor uh, six low pan traffic. Like test and verify that that your stuff is actually capturing six low pan pro uh, properly, displaying it correctly in Wireshark if that's what you're using to to analyze the data. So the the six low pan challenge that I created is two Raspberry Pis that are communicating back and forth with each other over six low pan. I uh, see they're they're using the Open Labs 802.15.4 uh, radios. One of the one of them is a client. One of them is a server. One of the the client is one of the challenges is that the client is running ping six with an ASCII payload. Uh, that's something you could see even if you're not properly decoding uh, six low pan, you might get lucky and see that that text going by, um, and the keys are usually pretty obvious. But just ping six with an ASCII payload. And then that client is also getting well, periodically getting a page over a web page over HTTP, uh, and there's there's a key on that page, uh, and also a link to a second web page with an additional key. So here's what that looks like if you're if you're monitoring that that traffic in in Wireshark with whatever tool you choose to use. Uh, so on the left there, there's an IP ICMP v6 packets, and you see a DEF CON 30 demo uh, key going by there. Uh, just regular ping six between two different uh, two different addresses. You'll see a WCTF in in that um, uh, in the payload down there. That is actually just part of the IPv6 addresses that I chose to use for this. I figured I'd throw a little Easter egg in there in addition to the key, and also something to make make it more clear that. This is part of the the wireless capture flag. Uh, over on the the right, you'll see the the web page that is that the client is requesting. Uh, it's just getting getting a root, so it's getting index.html. And if you follow that stream, you'll see uh, the entire GET request and the HTML that's coming across. Uh, you'll see the the key, the demo six six low pin uh, RX key in there, and then you can see the link to that that additional page. And if you open those up in a browser, this is what they this is what they look like. So it's 
just a little page saying like, hey, six Lopan is fun. Here's your, here's your key. And then are you really on the network? Can you click this link? Can you, can you also request this page? And that, that key link will take you into a second page with the TX key or a key that's only available if you, if you go and request that page yourself. Uh, something that was possible for a while, in, and I think a number of people were doing, were passively sniffing while other people were solving this portion of it. Uh, for the most recent iteration, I added HTTPS to the key page. So the client will request the, the, the regular page, the index.html over HTTP, and that goes across in clear text, and other people can see that. Uh, you can passively sniff that and get that flag. But now when you go to the key, uh, that's encrypted over HTTPS, and so other people won't be able to passively steal flags uh, if you're competing in the wireless capture flag. Next up, a new challenge for this year. I wanted to introduce a, an RFCTF 6 Lopan Fox. And so for anybody that doesn't know what I mean by a fox in the turn, you know, within the confines of an RFCTF, uh, fox hunting, aka mobile finding mobile transmitters is what we're talking about. So in this case, there will be a 6 Lopan transmitter roving around uh, whatever conference we're at. And the goal will be to go and find that transmitter. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with fox hunting, there's a DEFCON 22 uh, talk in the Wireless Village by Adam Worth called Practical Fox Hunting 101. This is an ex excellent intro to fox hunting, and talk he talks about a number of different techniques and considerations that you need to think about when, when fox hunting. Uh, we're not going to go into all of those during this talk, but if that's something you're interested in, definitely go find that, that video and watch that talk. There's a lot of great information in there. So when I was creating this challenge, so one of the most important things that, that you need for fox hunting is to be able to figure out where that signal is, figure out you know, how far away from that, that signal am I. So where's the signal strength? And if you look in this, this capture from below, there's a bunch of, bunch of information in, in that capture, but one of the things that's missing is signal strength. There's no RSSI, there's no, no other way of representing um, signal strength and so I want to make sure that this is solvable. So when I created this challenge originally, I started looking through a bunch of my captures, started capturing a bunch with all the different tools that I had, and I found that none of them had signal strength available. It took me into this rabbit hole of, you know, why, why is signal strength missing? Where, where would I find that? Is there anything that will show me that? And I started thinking about, um, you know, this is something that shows up in when I do, uh, when I sniff Wi-Fi with, you know, Aircrack or some other tools. Uh, it usually shows up in a header above the, uh, above that, that Mac layer stuff. It's an extra, extra layer that showed, shows up in Wireshark. Um, and before we get into it, this is the, this XACD comic is the most applicable to what I found in this rabbit hole that I went down. There, it turns out there are multiple ways to, to represent signal strength, uh, and there are many different standards. There doesn't seem to be a clear winner. There's some, some, some that sort of win in, in Wi-Fi, but there's, there's even less of a clear winner when it comes to 802.15.4. So in 802.11, uh, there's a, uh, most commonly if you're ca capturing with air crack or something like that, you'll see a radio tap header and you also see underneath that a WLAN radio header. Uh, actually, both of those additional protocol layers will show you uh, some form of signal strength, and you can go and look in, in your PCAPs for that. There's also a case PPI pattern or header. So case, like for anybody that remembers the Air PCAPs, the company that made those, uh, case per packet information is what that stands for. And that's another way to represent a number of different uh, extra data fields with additional information about each packet. So when we get to 802.15.4, uh, there is an 802.15.4 radio tap header uh, that's relatively new. I think, I want to say 2015 or so, somewhere in that range. Um, with the NRF sniffer for that NRF dongle that I mentioned earlier, their, their dongle uh, will let you do that as long as you specify an additional metadata field. So that IEEE 8254 tap uh, as the metadata. Uh, you can also select that in Wireshark, which we'll show in, in just a minute. Uh, with Z with Killerbee, uh, that, uh, it, Killerbee uses another um, 
header. It uses the, the case PPI headers, so the old 802.11 standard. Uh, they kind of repurpose that for, uh, for 802.15.4. ZBDump does not use that header by default, so you need to use the dash P flag or dash, uh, double dash PPI flag in ZBDump. And then you'll get that per packet information, you'll get signal strength. Um, this is something that took me a little while to figure out because in the in the help output for, for ZBDump, it doesn't tell you what that dash P stands for. So if you don't know that PPI stands for per packet information, you might miss that option in ZBDump. But both of those tools will will capture signal strength for you, and that's something that you could you could use to potentially fox hunt. So I mentioned that the NRF dongle uh, and the, the Python script for that is available as an XCAP interface for capturing data in Wireshark. And here's what that looks like when you're configuring it. So you can select the channel that you want to capture on. You can select uh, 802.15.4 tap uh, from that out-of-band metadata. Uh, and then if you look on the right there, you'll see that 802.15.4 tap layer above the, uh, above the 802.15.4 data. And you can see we have an RSS, in this case, of negative 51 dBm. So that's, that's the kind of information that we need to be able to uh, fox hunt successfully. And that's, that's all I've got for you today. So if you have any questions, uh, the easiest place to find me is going to be on the RF Hacker Sanctuary Discord. Uh, my username on there is Red Baron. I'm also on Twitter with, you know, underscore the Red Baron, underscore some very, some number of underscores under there. You can find, find me from the, uh, from the RF Hacker Sanctuary website under the crew page. The, the bio listed there is 100% accurate. Um, and yeah, this, like I said, this is, this is not original research. This is just something, you know, this talk was intended to, to help people with some of the things that I've struggled with in interacting with some of these networks and to convey some of the lessons that I've learned over the years of, of interacting with these things. Uh, so I'm hopeful that you know, more people will interact with the, these types of, of networks, uh, go, go find more devices, maybe do some more driving with it, uh, interact with the, the RFCTF challenges a little bit more, and you know, hopefully so we get somebody to find the 6 low pan fox at some point. All right, that's all I've got for you today. Uh, thanks, and have a great day.